Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad to have everybody here. We've got uh, two musicians up front. It's like stereo when you're up here listening to them play. And we're glad to have you here this morning. If you're visiting, I'd like to say hello to you after the service. Um, pastor's under the weather, and uh, hopefully he'll return next week. And uh, he's be on the safe side. He doesn't know whether it's a cold or allergies, but he went ahead and had a COVID test done. It still isn't back. So he wants to know for sure. So you're what I'm here for. You. I'm here today, right? So with, without any uh, further ado, I'd ask you to rise and I'll lead in the call of worship. <clears throat> Our call to worship today comes from the book of Psalms chapter 146, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Let's remain standing and let's open our hymnals to number 57. Your red hymnal, number 57, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. your throne of grace uh, cautiously uh, looking at ourselves 
searching our hearts for sin not confessed, for our ways that aren't pleasing to you. For we know that through your glory, through your Son, Christ Jesus, we have a place appointed to us in heaven. And we are called to admit our unrighteous attitudes and our sinful behavior to you, O Lord, and to others that might be affected. That we might come in today to worship the Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds for the hearing of the word, for the preaching of the word, that we might bless you as humble believers in Christ. We pray now for the rest of this service that your hand would be upon us, even your servant here. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song again. We're going to sing the next hymn. Claude printed me out the announcements. I failed to make them. We're in the middle of the service. I realize in the bulletin there's no announcements. I'm going to print these off. We'll print them off after the service, okay? So our, our next hymn is number 101, Come Thou Almighty King. draw our attention back to the Lord in uh, prayer. And, uh, so just uh, pray with me. Our gracious Lord, we are humbled. We are, are brought low of your greatness, of your majesty, your infinite wisdom, your omnipotence of, of your being that we don't and will never fully understand. For we are but but men and women, we are but dust. Unworthy, Lord, but you call us into your kingdom. 
that day when the eyes shed the cover and the ears open and the heart is renewed and we see that you have suffered and bled on the cross for us. And not only that, but you died and three days later you rose from the grave. You are our answer to all our help. You are the answer to the frustrations in our lives at our age. You, Lord, are the vengeance for wrong acts and not ours. And you in time and your time and time alone, if you decide that you will repay. Help us, Lord. Uh, help us to... Uh, Fully show to those around us at work and our families and our friends and our neighbors of our desire and our love of the Lord. And we think of those, our neighbors that know not the Lord. And yet we pray for them week after week, year after year. And uh, as my friends become older, we come closer to death. And we pray, Lord, that you would make the questions there so that we can provide the answers to show them, those around us, the glory of our Lord. We can be free at last. And we await, Lord, that day when you return to us and take us home if we have not already died to be with you and our families and our friends that are in Christ in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. Pray for our brother Graham here this morning that's going to be bringing us the word of God. And we pray for his, his joy of serving the Lord, <clears throat> of his joy to bring us the message from your word. Help us to glean from today from this service, from this time before the throne. Help us to grow and in ways that we have maybe no desire to grow, but you have a purpose in our lives. And Lord, for our, the many things that were, the gifts that you give us, Lord, the many gifts, help us not to shy away, but to, to use those gifts for your service, for your honor to be counted on when asked to be, have a zeal for serving, Lord. We are a family of God here. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to grow as we work with one another and encourage each other in Christ. When we think of our land, we think of the misery and the pain the last couple of years have caused. But you were there in the midst. You are there now in the midst. You always have and you always will be. So Lord, we pray for wisdom on the part of our elected officials, on those in Congress and even the President himself. To honor you, Lord. To honor your word and not just the word of men and women in the United States. In the Old Testament, Lord, you, you called the people to call out, to cry out to you, O Lord. And in the desert, they cried out to the Lord, and he heard their cry, and they repented of their sins, and he healed their land. Help us in our walk this week, guide and direct us. And help us now as we continue to worship this morning. And we ask it all in Christ's precious name. Amen. You're going to remain seated for the next hymn. And that's number 87 in our hymnal. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want.
tithes and offerings. tithes and offerings as part of worship the joy to give to you Lord I pray that you would use the monies for your kingdom for your church here and missions throughout the world we pray that our worship would be honorable to you and our gifts we ask this all now in Christ's precious name Amen you may be seated Good morning. morning. Bring you greetings from my home church, Westfield OPC, Grace Westfield, and delighted to be here with you once again, and by God's grace, minister his word. My passage for this morning is the book of Philemon. I'm not going to attempt to do an exegesis of the entire book, but I do plan to read the entire 21 verses of Paul's letter to 
Philemon. But before I do that, let's once again look to the Lord in prayer. And Father, we take the words that we just sung, saying, Come, thou incarnate word. You are the incarnate word, Lord Jesus. Gird on your mighty sword. Our prayer attend. Come, and thy people bless, and give your word success. And you, Holy Spirit of God, Holy Comforter, give your word success. On us descend, and let your word go forth and accomplish that for which you intend it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Hear then from God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word, Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant. As a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, For I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's set the the setting here. Let me summarize 
for you what's going on here. Philemon is a member of the church at Colossae. In fact, the letter to the Colossians and this small letter to Philemon go hand in hand. Perhaps Philemon was one of the officers there at Colossae. And he had a bondservant by the name of Onesimus. And apparently Onesimus and Philemon didn't have the best of relationships. Apparently he was considered useless by Philemon. And so Onesimus ran away. And in the providence of God, the scripture doesn't tell us exactly how, he came to Rome and met Paul, and perhaps Epaphras, Paul's fellow prisoner, and under their ministry, Onesimus was converted. That's what Paul means when he says he has begotten this man in his imprisonment. In other words, Onesimus was converted. And now Paul is determining to appeal to his friend Philemon to receive Onesimus back. Now keeping that whole matter in your mind, the whole issue of Philemon and his runaway slave, consider what Paul wrote under the Holy Spirit's inspiration at Romans 3.31. This is what he wrote there. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And that's a statement by which the apostle drives a stake through the heart of the false doctrine that says that the law is somehow abolished under the gospel. Just like Jesus did when he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17. But that brings us to my first point, which is a question. Keeping in mind what we've just seen from Philemon, did the Apostle Paul himself despise the law in this case? Specifically, the law at Deuteronomy 23, 15, and 16. I'd like you to turn to that so you can see this for yourself. It's kind of a shocker when you think about it. Deuteronomy 23, 15, and 16 gives a very specific commandment. It says, You shall not give back to his master the slave who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst, in the place which he chooses within one of your gates, where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. Whoa! What's going on here? Isn't that exactly what Paul did in sending Onesimus back? Think about it. it, Doesn't it seem like the same man who said, who wrote under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, oh, we uphold the law under the gospel. It seems that here he's breaking the law of God in a very specific and definite way. Well, don't you love it when scripture presents us with what seems irreconcilable, two things that can't possibly go together. Like when Jesus asks, how does David call the Messiah Lord when he's his son? Jesus' enemies couldn't answer that, but we know it's both, isn't it? He is the root and the offspring of David. And so we have a similar situation here. But how do we reconcile it? Is it by simply ignoring the Lord's statement that he didn't come to abolish the law? Or is it by casting aside our persuasion that the scriptures are inerrant and saying, oh, well, I guess uh, Paul contradicts himself in his letters. No, no. It's by recognizing that there is a greater fulfillment of the law's righteous requirements in Christ. 
As we've seen in verse 10, when Paul writes that he had begotten Onesimus, what that means is that in his conversion, this bondservant Onesimus was transformed. The gospel transforms us. He was transformed from a troublesome, useless slave of Philemon into a useful servant in the kingdom of God. Philemon had heard that glorious message that the eternal Son of God took on flesh. He became the incarnate Word. And he lived a perfectly sinless life. He was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And he gave that life, that perfect life, that unblemished life on the cross when the just wrath of God due to God's elect people was poured out upon the Lamb of God, upon the Son of God. And because he fully paid the price, because he accomplished the ransom, he rose from the dead so that those that believe and trust in this message, in this Lord and Savior, could know that they are justified forever. He rose victorious on the third day, victorious over sin, death, and hell. This is the message that Onesimus, the bondservant, had come to embrace and rejoice in, as I hope every one of you here this morning has done. And the gospel, that same gospel, had already transformed Philemon, Onesimus's master, as well. So now, through the gospel, the two men, master and servant, have a new relationship that we could say just swallows up their old relationship. Yes, Paul was sending him back, and he was likely going to be in Philemon's household once again, but their relationship was now completely different. So Paul is not disobeying the law of God in Deuteronomy 23, but through the gospel there is a transcending and glorious fulfillment. Onesimus is now a brother. They are both Philemon and Onesimus, along with Paul and Ephraim and all of us who belong to Christ, we're all servants of the same Lord. What a demonstration of the power of the gospel. The power of God unto a salvation that's not just pie in the sky. It transforms you and me from being useless in God's sight to being his beloved and useful in our master's kingdom. And there's another way in which we see the law rightly upheld and kept under the gospel. In verses 8 and 9, we have Paul's appeal to Philemon. He says, I'm not going to command you to take Onesimus back. I'm appealing to you, my brother. I'm earnestly asking you. The law as given on Sinai with darkness and smoke and threats makes fleshly hearts hate the law and shrink away in error and terror before the lawgiver, hiding like Adam did in Eden. But the renewed heart, the heart that has been born again, regenerated, loves the law of our gracious Savior God. We love the law as summarized by our Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And as we continue in our discipleship, don't we love those two great commandments and long for the day 
when we can fully obey them as we will in the glory to come. We're never perfect here, but in that glory to come, we will always love our God with a burning white-hot love. And everyone there in the realm of glory will love each other perfectly. And we long for that. And we love that law. And all the law and the prophets, all the details point to that. It all, as Jesus says, it all hangs upon those two commandments. So, as renewed Christians, we love the law. We're not shrinking away as in terror. The darkness and the smoke and the terror is all gone in Christ because it all came down on him when he once for all satisfied the demands of the law for his people. So how does James put it? The wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and hypocrisy. You know, that's the spirit in which Paul is appealing to Philemon and expecting that Philemon, his fellow Christian, is going to respond with that kind of wisdom, with that kind of a heart. So the preaching of the gospel is not a matter of do this and live, but it's a matter of Jesus has satisfied the law's dread demands for you. You have a gift righteousness, Christian believer. You stand before God justified. So because you are alive in Christ, don't you long to live pleasing to him. Be encouraged. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Press on in this walk of discipleship, being sanctified. So through Philemon, we see the gentleness and tactfulness of Paul, which is to be imitated. He's the one who said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. More importantly, as we come to our next point, we see the heart of the gospel once again in verses 18 and 19. It says, but if he has wronged you, that is, if Onesimus has wronged you, Philemon, if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention that you owe me even your own self besides. And isn't that the essence of what the gospel is all about? Isn't that a picture of it? If you've never grasped what that message that I summarized moments ago means, that the Son of God came and lived and died and rose from the dead, that Jesus paid for the sins of his people on the cross. If you've never fully embraced that or grasped it, if it seems alien to you, the letter of Philemon lays it out with this powerful illustration. Paul is imitating what Christ did. He's taking as his own responsibility whatever debt Onesimus owed to Philemon. We don't know what exactly the trouble between the two was, but Paul is saying, I'll take it. I'll take the responsibility. I'll take the punishment. Whatever it is that he owes you, I'm going to take care of it, Philemon. And this is exactly what the Holy Spirit was foreshadowing when he recorded in Genesis through Moses what the patriarch Judah said to his father Jacob about his brother Benjamin. When Benjamin, when the man that they didn't know was Joseph demanded that Benjamin come down, what did Judah say to Jacob? I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you 
and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. There it is again, the patriarch Judah foreshadowing for us what his descendant, the lion of the tribe of Judah, would do. He would bear the blame before his father, and he would come and set the sons of the father before him. He would take it on himself. This is what the Spirit pictured for us through Boaz, the kinsman redeemer who raised up a seed for his brother, his relative, according to another gracious provision of the law. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus, our great elder brother, our faithful kinsman redeemer, looked upon those who were slaves of sin according to God's just judgment which has sealed everyone under sin. Jew and Gentile, all are under sin's guilt and corruption. So in effect, Jesus said to the Father, I will be surety. Require it from me. In whatever they have wronged you, put it to my account. And so now the slaves are free. They are his brethren. This is what we see in this little book of Philemon. Yet another picture of Christ. Don't we believe that all the scripture is all about Jesus Christ? It all speaks to us about him, his person and work. Well, here it is. Here it is. Paul imitated Christ, God incarnate. In Ephesians 5.1, he tells us to do likewise. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And that brings us to my final point as we come to a close here this morning. As we look at this instruction an example for us to be not only preaching, but living the gospel. Being like Paul and Philemon and Onesimus, being another example of that whole scenario. Living the gospel. Let's again consider what Paul wrote elsewhere. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so we have that same duty under the gospel to not only preach it, to not only give others the message of salvation, but to demonstrate it, to live it, in our lives, to be reconcilers. He said God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave it to the apostles and it comes down through the centuries to us sitting here this morning. The beatitude doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. It says blessed are the peacemakers. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We have to go and send Onesimuses back to Philemon, so to speak, appealing and having under our ministry seen people transformed and brought into a new relationship in Christ that, that transcends whatever old relationships there might have been that recognizes that any grudges that we might have had are all done away with. They're all under the blood. What, what place do we have as a Christian to hold a grudge against another? If, was Philemon being a consistent Christian if he was holding something against Onesimus? No, Paul appeals to him. He appeals to him to have that wisdom 
that James described and, and receive this now born again man back. Yes, he can still continue in that relationship, but, but you have something so much greater and better now. There's no more grudge to be held. And Onesimus, you're not useless anymore. You're going to want to, more than ever, be a blessing to Philemon and his household and to serve them wholeheartedly. Again, it's not a matter of abolition of the law. Jesus did not come to abolish. He came to fulfill. Jesus alone did the fulfilling, didn't he? Again, when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, he was both bearing the law's penalty and he was showing that his people were justified. He earned the reward of obedience for his people. According to his own commandment, we are to keep the law knowing we can never use it to justify ourselves. We're justified already in Christ. But again, when we're born again, given new hearts, we love the law and become motivated by love for him to keep it. We love him who first loved us. In both Onesimus' and Philemon's case, what they were now to do was probably not easy. Philemon might have been skeptical about Onesimus coming back. Onesimus might have been fearful. Is he really going to receive me back? And so it's not going to be easy for us as we live the gospel, as we take on that ministry of reconciliation. But the love of God was shed abroad in their hearts. And if we are in Christ, that's what the scripture says. That the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. So that we can in this way live the gospel. May God enable us to do likewise. That the sharing of our faith. That's what he says in verse 6. Back in verse 6. Paul says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Share and live the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example we have in this letter, this demonstration of the gospel, this call to us to be reconcilers, to know how to appeal, and to have that kind of wisdom that is gentle and open to reason. Father, may we learn not to hold grudges and not to be useless, but, Father, to be transformed into useful servants who recognize that as we have been forgiven much, so we are to forgive others. Father, bless this word to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is number 547, with harps and with vials. Please stand as we sing.
now receive the benediction, the good word from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.